Thanks for turning up, everybody. Really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to be real quick. This is top tour of the last eight years of my life developing a practice based PhD. Um, I'm a songwriting teacher at Basketball University, and I was always intrigued about the way great songwriters embed their own identity into their, own, into their songs. You know, Taylor like Leonard Cohen song, John Lennon song, um, uh, David Bowie songs to the degree that David Bowie songs are quite difficult to cover if anyone's ever tried it. It's, you know, it's sort of slightly like, like prestige David Bowie, so much of it in haunting the songs. Um, and I wanted to do something, I wanted to investigate something that was useful for the students that I teach because breaking through and uh, commodifying, I guess, and marketizing, commercializing what they do uh, is a uh, you know, principle that doesn't run through all, all music and all songwriting, but certainly the people who can study for us want to do it for a living, so I wanted to find something useful. Um, uh, but, Yes, uh, exploring identity in original song is a fraught undertaking because identity is such a noisy term. It's a, um, a conceptual minefield. The more I read into it, the more I can go up and come different kind of streams of, the, and of uh, sociology and psychology and, and all the rest of it. And ultimately, all I wanted to do was work out a way for songwriters to, to gauge or to sort of put. I guess, um, come on in. Hey, come on in. Sorry. Hey, I'll just whiz back a little bit here now. Sorry. Guys, right, let's set up some more. Okay, so I'm a songwriting teacher. I want to teach people um, how to embed their own identity in their own songs. I want to teach people, but it's something that always intrigued me. And um, the uh, quantification, commercialization of songs, I think i for it. Uh, Darwinistic and um, and I launched into a kind of PhD, if you like. So, so this is the culmination of eight years' work exploring identity in original song. And identity was such a buzzy, noisy term, uh, loaded with so much baggage, that um, I decided it's to keep it very, very simple, to remember, to recall that I'm trying to kind of enter into a dialogue about how we present ourselves and how we create uh, an identity to project out into the world from um, ACT, our song. And I think I found something fascinating in social identity theory. In particular, uh, this theory, uh, Marilyn Brewer, an American academic, now working in Australia, uh, wrote, wrote into her book, The Social Self. It's, it comes from sociology, social psychology, psychology, and lately consumer research. And it um, holds that, that we, our social identities operate on various different levels, and at, at each of these various different levels, um, we see what she calls optimality, which is a, a balance between the drive to dis assimilate and the drive to differentiate. Two opposing drives keep each other in check, uh, form an equilibrium. It's kind of a scary diagram here. I'll simplify it for you a little bit. Uh, when inclusion is high, something's easy to join or, or become a part of. Uh, uh, then the drive for differentiation goes right up. Uh, similarly, if something's uh, difficult to get in, into, exclusive clubs and whatever you might uh, want to get into, the, uh, the drive for assimilation goes right up. Better conceived visually is this, uh, is this diagram here. Uh, when things are inclusive, easy to join, there's strong drive to differentiate. When things are difficult to join, there's a strong drive to assimilate. Those two diagrams mashed together are more or less like this. So, uh, inclusive, high drive for differentiation, exclusive, high drive for assimilation. And she suggests that there's a kind of point of balance that, that people, individuals in groups, uh, aspire to. and develop uh, across the various different, different social identities that they form. You know, a bit like Doffman's theory of the various uh, personas that we adopt in socialization processes. So, um, people picked up on her work. Uh, Annie Brems, um, uh, uh, through his um, empirical work, proves something we all know, and that is that you love your band until everyone loves it, and then you sort of de-invest from it. Nirvana fans will know that, that phenomenon. Um, he at all uh, uh, 
uh, established that consumers acquire and display material possessions to restore personal levels of distinctiveness. So if they feel like they stick out a bit too much, they need to dress or buy stuff that kind of helps them assimilate. Similarly, if they're considered a bit boring, they'll, they'll buy some you know, leather skin shoes or something. Okay, Prime Minister. And, um, uh, and Chan Berger Van Boven uh, established that conformity drives choice in consumer items that signal membership to an in group, but uniqueness uh, motive, motives drive preferences at, within the at the sort of uh, sorry at the within group level. So uh, it's uh, but that's sort of in the in the realm of consumer behaviour uh, in artifact design. Um, Pickett et al. So it's in industrial design, people prefer novel designs as long as the novelty does not affect typicality. Consumers prefer typicality, and this is not to the detriment of novelty. Berger, in his uh, book, Hidden Influence, argues that ODT was at work when Apple introduced the iMac. Um, no longer a kind of an ugly tower, Apple made it a bit of furniture you stick in your house. So once people understood it as a cool bit of furniture, then of course sales went through the roof. TiVo's were initially introduced. Uh, it's looked like DVD plays, even though they're hard drives. Uh, people like familiarity and a little bit of a, uh, uh, innovation attached to it. Prototypical looking cars sell better. Um, names of hurricanes influence the popularity of baby names. Why modern art might seem great in the first time, the first time you see it, but why well, I'm looking at a couple of the cars says, can discs more pleasing on the eye? Only T, only T is, is, known, uh, is uh, balances the familiar and the novel. So, uh, this is a diagram. Uh, indicating this dynamic equilibrium balances assimilation, differentiation, typicality, and uniqueness. So it occurred to me that um, in the history of, kind of popular music, we've always, always um, appreciated the bands and acts that arise out of the scene, out of movements, of genres, and subcultures, but they, they move and on a little bit. They, they change it, they add something to it, they innovate. Um, Acts rarely arrive out of the blue, some, some do, but in a general sense, um, they will kind of reflect the discourses that they arose from and um, then they you know, do this in relation to their previous work. Okay. They'll be a bit the same and a bit different. Um, live sets will be some of the old stuff, not some of the new stuff. Um, I'm sure that Neil Young. Uh, and uh, recently, Zuckerman critiques ODT as being limited to individual behaviors. You know, individuals in social groups. So he argued that this could be adapted to a view that organizations and their products, organizations, should I say organizations that make products, um, are better understood as either uh, working to different audiences, one identity, two audiences. For example, manufacturers of car tires or headache tablets have to, have to assimilate with governmental recommendations and also appeal to the public in terms of what they offer, the differences. And he also proposed a theory, a, a, an ordinate, superordinate theory, called two-stage valuation. It's one identity, but one audience. Conforming to the performance expectations of categorization, beer, shampoo, shoe, or computer, was differentiating to compete through dimensions of difference. So, it occurred to me that, that we can, this is an elegant system with which to, to view original acts and the songs that they make, and, uh, and their entire sort of aesthetic output. Um, first of all, through conforming to categorization, and secondly, to uh, uh, I guess the, the dimensions of difference that they add to that categorization, the thing that makes them different within their genre. Okay, um, thanks to Philip McIntyre. Uh, so, uh, my kind of analytical or auto ethnographic approach. Um, saw me um, noting every part of the process of, of writing, writing four albums across eight years, um, uh, all the points at which inflections of identity were, were decisions that we made in the, in the writing team or the production team. Um, and this list of, uh, of domains, if you like, or kind of concepts, concept variables, were um, what emerged out of it. And, uh, uh, and those, that set of concepts can more or less be divided into what you might call the genre aspects and stylistic variations of those genres. So, uh, in a way that can 
Alan Moore uh, uh, suggests is, is the way, right way to, to view genre and style, that style is nestled within genre. Um, and then Franco Fabri says that those two terms are, are kind of a bit fluid with each other, but I like the idea of the genre and the style attenuating genre. You know? First case study. Well, I did four, four projects across this eight years. Two of them disappeared down the trace, and two of them gained some kind of visibility. The most recent one is a, it's a reboot of, of my band from the early noughties, called Pusto. Rebooting that project, that we'd be, uh, we might end up being kind of middle aged folks doing smooth kind of dinner. This last year, and, he, uh, and played some uh, sold-out shows in Milan and Rome and London and Porto. And um, the reception to, to this album was um, shockingly positive. Uh, didn't expect it. Oh, everything's made on this laptop over here. Uh, it was awarded album of the year last year by Music Republic magazine. It's lighter about that because Stormzy was number two. And, which impressed my daughter, and uh, Dragon Bone Man, and um, Wolf Alice, and all this stuff. Um, uh, album, of, album of the Month, uh, four albums to be thankful for, playlist here, uh, Bernard Zul's uh, Roundup Best of the Year, um, 10 out of 10 in, in an Italian blog, um, Editor's Choice, and kind of all music.com, four out of five, news reviews, five out of five, so um, oh yeah, this one, five out of five review here. Some, this response, if you like, the way that the, the uh, third party uh, reviewers and journalists viewed and appreciated and fed back to the world about our music is, it helps triangulate this, this identity thing. Because I think we, we've certainly got it right in this, on this album. Uh, a whole bunch of other things for, for Stars and Mojo, 8 out of 10 in Record Collector, uh, Tune of the Day, KSOW in LA, and All Music. And, um, Huff Post, uh, to my horror, the Express liked it, <laughs> um, but I'll take whatever I get. So, the assimilating parts of this, the kind of a, the the genre, if you like, the genre kind of a stylistic uh, aspects that we managed to con consolidate was this set of uh, set of aesthetic, I guess, uh, 
um, aspects, but the slight twist we made on uh, on that set of usual suspects, which, by the way, was this lot here. Um, these are all the kind of the, the acts that the journalists said we sounded like. Um, kind of rum crew here, uh, that are very flattering. So I think what we added to that was this um, this full out idealized self, this kind of a. Um, but I should talk about some of these concepts. Modality is, is something that uh, that comes from um, critical discourse analysis, and it's, it's the way kind of politicians like hedge their commitments to things, or uh, uh, it's the kind of verite truthfulness in the, in I guess uh, photography. Let's say uh, the difference between the paparazzi photo or the, or the actress at the beach to a kind of highly stylized photo. You know, it's the it's the how close this is to your actual self and how much it sort of idealize or fantasize, I suppose. Um, conceptions of the desirable, the kind of values, this word comes from Hitler, and I like it for values because it's a, um, it works with lyrics because these are kind of choices we, I made when I was making this stuff, is that um, how to kind of load in our identity as, kind of, as vibrant as, as manner as I can. Um, the mode of address in the lyrics is important, I think. The dramatic mode, as we know, as, as you may know, is a, is a kind of a, uh, the, the address to an imaginary person there and not there. It's a very intimate, second person kind of thing. Um, beloved of the ballad and the love song. Uh, I think the idiolectic quality in the, that the singer has uh, was this roguish crooner. It's not, it wasn't a sort of a, wasn't a, sort of a, a um, a Michael Bublé kind of character, and he said it's a Mark Lanigan kind of character, and that kind of updated the thing. Uh, so, and according to all those journalists, these aspects, sensuality, seeped in darkness, sexy, up, delicate, elegant, decadent, pop, um, evocative, reflective, richly romantic to regretful, so the, these are, I think, the kind of the qualitative bits of data that um, I think rather reliably um, Call out what's different about this to uh, to our previous work, and also to uh, you know the kind of a, the genre in which we sit. Second study is a reboot of uh, UK legend Carl Brack, this fellow here, um, who kind of a, in the generation defining libertines. I didn't like them very much myself. They were an awful racket. Uh, but um, uh, but I called upon to kind of help re-engineer his career as a as a co-writer. Um, the brief was from his management that they wanted to be through a second stage here as this sort of indie landfill um, band called the uh, uh, Dirty Pretty Things. And um, the time was right for him to kind of adult up a bit. So they got me in and said, look, we want, we want it to be a bit more Nick Cave and a bit more sort of, um, I don't know, a bit more Leonard Cohen, if you can. Um, try and kind of reboot him for, for an adult audience. And so, Kind of a, was like a split screen, two cultures. The broadsheets magazines thought it was brilliant and uh, got album of the week and uh, 
was that on Radio One. It was kind of a, it was the most important album record of the, of the week, and it got playlisted on BBC Two, played about four or five times a day on BBC Two. So we managed that thing of bringing him to a broader audience. Uh, all the projects were kind of largely um, positive. Went to number four on the chart, the, the UK indie chart. That I should uh, make clear. Number 42 on the iTunes chart. It did a good job. Even Alan McGee said it was the only record he liked it, that, that year. So all the sort of gatekeepers said, yes, this is, this is a brilliant new thing. However, uh, the enemy <laughs> said, ultimately, the characters are the real colors. This lugubrious love pie just doesn't gel. More worrying than an egg. He says he's dressed up in grand wire, motive sent. It seems to come, come from a lack of real emotional investment. Lindsay in turn, Lothario, Cody's love lawn ballads with all sorts of sonic goo. Got these two magazines kind of read podcast very important. Guardian 205. Um, the whole project was marred, in my view, by the album cover here, which suggests something kind of highly mobile. This is private inside the kind of bedroom sort of thing. And uh, but the song of the album was, was full of caricatures. And uh, while it was similar to that stuff there, it was um, differentiated by that stuff there. But it was largely seen as a mistake. Uh, his audience has kind of jumped up and down, I toured as a keyboard player, but well, he's jumped up and down the live team numbers and kind of looked at their phones when the new stuff got played. This, this optimal distinctiveness went too far the wrong way. It was the Dylan going electric moment. Anyway, um, we've corrected this. With that racket. Uh, and they loved it again. <laughs> so, uh, the Guardian, oh, hey, uh, yeah. so, um, uh, and yeah, four stars out of the week, you know, probably 30 ones into it, 30. Uh, anyway, last time we had the other year of romantic poet, wasting moments of White Chapel Garrett, racked with depression. But now look how live these scenes, these scenes, you know, they, they love that. So, similar to all that mark, punky stuff, and differentiated by all that stuff's there. So, and I just had to conclude this, because I think it's funny. The record's ground-shaking volume serving only to mute the lonely whimper of a man whose efforts to rewrite the past have pushed him to breaking point. And, um, rough with the smooth. Uh, and so all those kind of aspects of heavy guitars, plucked from bass, punky drums, fast, fast tempos, a um, bit of differentiation in there, with the idealized itself as a political insurgent, uh, all the usual kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, anti-capitalists, kind of, uh, um, you know, um, what's it called, um, uh, sorry, that resistance movements, um, the anonymous, that's what, the anonymous kind of, you know, that's what kind of wrote that whole thing. So, I'm going to stop with that. Uh, but just to say that Brew extended her formula uh, of opt optimal distinctiveness to suggest that it's, that's operational on three clearly different levels. I believe that these can be mapped very closely to the original artists in relation to other acts, the artists in relation to the listener, the artists in relation to the public profile. And I think I made it on time. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got probably time for two or three questions if anyone wants to ask a question. So, yeah, so David, what was the, the germination of that final album? Did, did you ha have like an aesthetic brief for working on that punk material? Yes, yes we did, yeah. yeah. And, and did um, that come from the record company, from the artist, from you? It came, came from Carl, actually. Right. He said, look, I wonder, can you help me recruit a band? Right. Because I want to come with band of brothers with leather jackets on, you know, and uh, all right. that stuff. And, uh, and so we did. And famously, we did on Facebook, and you know, so thousands of applicants. Oh, that's a silly process. But, um, yeah, he just wanted to pump back up. He just didn't, didn't think it with the, the, the Nick Cave anymore. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, it's pulled out of that and I think corrected his kind of the, his great, great thing back into the, that familiarity with his old self that right. his audience demanded. It went too far the other way. It was, it was his um, that album, first album. Even though the pub press liked it, so in a way, at the collective level, uh, the gatekeeper said, yes, come on in. His, his audience won't come with him because he did he, 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 um, ruptured something. So, uh, in, in the paradigm of the optimal distinctiveness theory, <coughs> the, the, the final example you're, 
you want us to infer that's the familiarity end of the spectrum. Absolutely. And yeah. because there were too many Libertines fans at the gigs who wanted more of the same, right? Yeah, exactly, right, right. And, and the way he, could, he differentiated that final album was he, that he, he, lyrically, he made it all about the collective rioting, we are, let's resist. It was all we um, pronouns, and less of the I lyrical, lyrical mode of address, right. more of the collective political mode of address. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Is it a sense that the, in the, in the Cal Brown, um, uh, example that the initial identity was too strong to move away from? And what would it have taken for that to actually be deemed a success by the label and by the artist, presumably to cross over to an entirely new audience and for it to become kind of mainstream? Because from what you said, a positive reception says something about kind of gatekeepers in a yes. kind of post-digital age as well, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose my question is, do you think it was too strong to break away from in terms I, I, of those initial identities? I, I, I think so, sense. yeah. Uh, I had the sense that he was a hostage to, to his impact, the impact on his music. I think some people like Paul Weller perhaps feel the same thing. And, uh, uh, or Morrissey. Um, the, the momentum of, his, uh, of the identity he had established was, I mean, for that generation of people, and I was here, uh, he was a, you know, a John Lennon sort of character. I mean, he really was all a Michael Jam or um, you know, Smiths. And I think that, that Paul, that, that gravity is, as you pointed out, is so strong sometimes that, that you have to be very careful how distinctive he is. We um, yeah, tipped it too far. Uh, yes, sir. Just thinking about the nuances of it in that career, it seemed to be too sudden a shift. Yes. Whereas you know, the, the original music that you're playing you know, seems to be the beginning of a career, and where you went in one album was the end of a career in yes. some ways. And if it had been incremental, the audience may have gone with you in the same way as many other artists. One simple change of differentiation in this album, but maintaining familiarity. Yes. They get familiar with this and differentiate there. Familiar with this, differentiate there, and you've yeah. got the same effect basically, except across a longer period of time. Do you yeah. think that would have been possible for it, to get the same position, but I'm, maybe four or five albums later? I think you're absolutely right. And, and thinking about it, 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 if those two albums had amalgamated early on, a bit of a racket, some romance, yeah. these always would have gone, gone with him. Um, but it was his management um, over here, we're going to. We, because his career was very much in the doldrums at the end of the end of the noughties, you know, just don't be creepy things by anyone. Dora is a poor facsimile of his previous iconic act. So, and they thought that he must re-engineer into his thirties into a sort of radio two. I suppose, you know, that, that did work, but um, it was too far too quick too soon. And I think there's a salutary tale in that, isn't it, uh, for us all? We are. Once established, you just need to move it on incrementally. Right? Uh, and the ultimate, optimal distinctiveness, uh, uh, it, it's sort of a, a framework, I think, that, that's elegant, uh, especially for kind of young artists to realize. You, I said to Jerry the other day, we have, how many times have those of you who talk, talk to said to some students, so what's your band sound like? And they go, oh, that's something, anything. And you go to rehearsal, that sounds a bit like it's all the radio. The usual suspects. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, yeah. Last one. Well, actually, I was going to ask you something. I was going to ask you about what, what's like te teaching. Do you, do you teach the optimal distinctiveness model in, mm -hmm. to a, a class of somewhere? Do you uh, not yet. Now, this is the time I've, I've sort of um, tried it on the public. Right, you know. And um, I, I, it's. it's um, Part of a sort of a, a reconfiguration re of my PhD. Right, yeah. It's a bit of an aha moment. I think I've got it got through the work now. Be curious to know, you know, as a pedagogical, you know, kind of model, how it comes Yeah, kind of, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, what I like about it is it's value free and ideology free. It's, it's just what you clearly send us to and how are you moving that on. Um, and, you know, yeah, those, those students that think that their, their genius just dropped out of the sky. Um, and they reinvented you know, guitar rock. Uh, might resist it, but I think that, that it's sensible to kind of realise, well, actually, everyone's usually associated with the movement, the genre, the counterculture, and it's good to feel, to be connected to that, but separate from it. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.